So let's talk about fracking a little bit. Underneath large parts of our nation, the bedrock is made up of shale. And this shale represents the, the floor of ancient oceans from 400 million years ago, the Devonian Age. And inside that rock are these bubbles of either oil or gas. They're actually trapped inside the rock, like bugs inside of amber. And they got there because um, they represent the bodies of ancient sea animals, mostly sea lilies and squid and plankton, far before we had um, animals on Earth with backbones or eyeballs or three-chambered hearts. Um, we're talking about jellyfish, sea lilies, and squid. So when those animals died and sank to the bottom of the ocean, they became bubbles of oil and gas. And, and they did not decompose. Uh, completely the way they would now, and that's because there was less oxygen on Earth at the time because there hadn't been land plants yet, right, and other reasons. And so, um, so you ended up with these bubbles of oil and gas at the bottom. They were covered over by silt, and that eventually petrified and turned into a kind of a chalkboard suffused with petrified fizz of bubbles of hydrocarbons. So these are the ancient sea floors, and, and so all of this, these bubbles of oil and gas have been trapped down there now for 400 million years. We, it used to be that we couldn't recover them all, because in order, order to recover them, you actually have to blow the bedrock apart. And no one figured out how to do that until fracking came along. And we combined fracking, which stands for hydraulic fracturing, with um, uh, horizontal drilling. So this was a, a kind of a newish technology that was first uh, perfected and, and deployed in the Intermountain West in places like um, Wyoming and uh, Colorado and northeastern Utah. And how it works is you drill down and then the drill bit turns sideways and like a robotic mole tunnels through this under, underground chalkboard. And then like, some explosives are sent down the hole to, to blow the whole thing into shards and to begin the process of the fracking, the fracturing. But the real tool, the real instrument of fracking is our water. So millions of gallons of fresh water are sent down the hole and is used as a club to shatter it further. And that allows those bubbles of hydrocarbon that have been trapped inside the rock to be liberated. But it's not that simple because um, if that's all you used was just water, what happens when you re release the, and, and, well, let me back up. So you have the, at least a mile of earth on top of all of the shale layer, right? So in order to generate that, that amount of pressure to use that the, the water needs to be under to blow the rock apart when you have the weight, what's called lithostatic pressure pressing down on it, is immense. And as soon as you release the pressure, all those shards are going to close back up again and the gas will be trapped. So you need to somehow prop those stony doors ajar to allow the gas and oil to flow up the hole. And, and, and for that, you use something you mine here in, in the Midwest, which is silica sand. Silica sand is the Samson of sand grains, and it has the strength to withhold lithostatic pressure. It won't crumble or be crushed. And so you add sand to the water, and then um, you shoot the this, this sand um, in a fire hose of pressure, um, and, and those sand grains hold the cracks open forevermore so that the um, oil and gas can come flowing out. Uh, so the, the story of fracking begins with sand. I want to emphasize that because it's going on right here in Minnesota. It's going on across the Mississippi River in Wisconsin. It's going on in Iowa. It's going on where I grew up in Illinois. The number one export of Wisconsin is now itself. It's no longer cheese. So they are blowing up the hills and the coolies and the bluffs of Wisconsin, all the sandstone bedrock. They're loading it into trains and barges, and then they're bringing it to where I now live, over the Marcellus Shale in the Northeast, and they're blasting it to the center of the ground to blow up my children's bedrock. Silica sand, when it, when it turns into dust in the air, is a known carcinogen. It's a lung carcinogen, and it causes silicosis. We've known about this for 2,000 years. 
The only people that we've ever exposed to silica dust in large amounts prior to fracking were people like sandblasters and glass blowers and people who work in the cement industry. And we know how to protect those people who are mostly young, healthy male adults um, through masks and things like that while they work. But now we're doing something different. We're exposing whole communities to silica dust, including pregnant women and children and elderly people. And they don't just work eight-hour shifts, and they can't just wear masks all day long. And when they sleep, when they feel the sand grains in their teeth that sift underneath their, their doors and their, uh, and their windows. And the state of Wisconsin justifies this by saying, we have no data to suggest that silica dust is harmful to children and women um, because we've never done the studies, because we've never exposed those people before. Therefore, there is no evidence for harm. Therefore, we will not pass any laws to regulate this or even monitor it. That's how it goes on. What's happening here in the upper Midwest with silica sand mining uh, is an obscenity, and it needs to stop. And there are people who are being arrested and putting their bodies on the line to do that, and they are mostly mothers. And this is a story we need to follow, and we need to trumpet, trumpet, and we need to, uh, to repeat the stories of the, uh, the fight against sand mining for fracking um, and, make it, and make it as common as what Rosa Parks did. That's what we need to do with this story now. All right, so let's go back underground. <laughs> Enough clapping, back to the biology. <laughs> so you got water and sand, but if, if those two things themselves are not sufficient um, to frack. Um, you need a lot of chemicals too. And you need chemicals for different reasons. Part of it is that you can't get the sand grains around the bend because they'll all settle out. So you need gelling agents in order to thicken up the water um, and turn it into a kind of gel to get the sand grain shot into the place where they need to go. And one of those gelling agents is guar, which is actually a living plant. It's a legume. Um, and so what also you see here, and, especially, and also in the Dakotas, is vast amounts of land that should be growing food that's devoted to growing guar. You also see this in India now, so, and where hunger has been created because farmers can get paid so much money for growing guar for the fracking industry to serve as a thickening agent. So this is also something to keep your eye on. But there are other chemicals that you need too because after you make all the water really thick then um, the gas can't get through so then you need breaker agents <coughs> to add in to break up that gel and slicken it out again. You need chemicals to reduce the friction, you need chemicals to inhibit corrosion, but most of all you need biocides because as Carolyn uh, referenced in her opening remarks, the inside of the earth, the deep heart of the planet is alive. It's a living ecosystem. It's not just a bunch of rocks and fire and brimstone down there. It's not inert. There are organisms that live in the dark heart of the planet. They're called archaea. It's an ancient domain of life. In fact, geologists now believe there may be more biomass in the deep dark heart of the planet than there is here at the sunlit surface. And if that's true, it means that those ancient uh, organisms are playing a role in our carbon cycle. It has, that has to be the case. Um, so, for the gas industry, they just refer to this problem as biofouling because what happens when you stick all that guar down there and all that water is that these organisms begin to proliferate because remember it's warm down there, it's about the temperature of, a, of bath water. Um, and so these organisms will begin to um, grow inside the pipe and interfere with the flow of gas. So very powerful biocides, which are essentially all-purpose pesticides, are poured down the hole to uh, annihilate all those living organisms in order for the gas to flow. So one of the reasons that fracking is so toxic is because of the dependency on these organisms to kill underground life. <coughs> so here's another thing about fracking. It makes water disappear from the hydrologic cycle. We've never done that before on a large scale, ever. So and this is worth sort of going back to seventh grade science class and pondering too. So you've got the water cycle, right? Let's start with rain. The rain falls down, some of it falls onto the earth, and eventually that water trickles down and, and becomes groundwater. 
some of that water falls into rivers and then the rivers go out to the ocean so some of that water then the rain becomes ocean water but then there are these artesian springs under the ground that bring the groundwater up and form the heads of the ocean so eventually groundwater becomes surface water and then it becomes rain again and it starts all over and somewhere in the middle of that we take a drink of that water and it becomes our blood plasma, it becomes our cerebral spinal fluid, it becomes our exhaled breath on a cold winter day, and then we pee it back into the toilets of America and it ends up back to surface water again. Or we, br we draw up groundwater when we irrigate our crops and we talk about wasting water, but we're not really sort of making it disappear. We're, we may be draining our groundwater faster than it can be recharged but eventually when we irrigate, let's say, alfalfa in Montana, um, that uh, groundwater becomes the, the juices of the alfalfa plant, which is going to then transpire and evaporate, carried as water vapor maybe out to the ships at sea where it will rain back down. So we may be transferring water from groundwater into the ocean, but we're not making it disappear. And if you leave your tap on and you're brushing your teeth and you're wasting water, you may be transferring that groundwater um, into the sept sewage septic tank, um, but then it will flow down the river and become somebody else's water. So it's still there, you're just transferring it. It's not necessarily all benign, but you're not making it go away. You're not really wasting water, you're not disappearing it. But with fracking, we're taking millions of gallons of water to use as a club. We're shooting it far below the groundwater into part of uh, the earth that doesn't have fresh water in it and we're using it to blow up um, the bedrock and then half of that water is going to stay trapped down there forever. We hope forever, right? Because we've put all these biocides in it. So we don't want it to come find its way north through unseen fractures and fissures, although that's a problem as we now know. So we're making water disappear from the, geo from the hydrological cycle. We're making it disappear. We've never done that. And we're doing it in a time of climate crisis when we know that uh, what fresh water resources are going to become less and less available um, to us as drinking water. And then what comes out of the hole then is the oil or natural gas, whatever the quarry is you're trying to get out. But in addition now, half of that uh, fracking fluid that you pump down into the ground comes up back up. And it's now poisoned with all the things that you poisoned it with, but in addition, on down to the center of the earth and back again in that journey it's picked up more poisons in the form of radioactivity right because there's uranium down there there's radon down there there's radium down there uh, and then heavy metals like uh, lead arsenic these things are also uh, naturally occurring in, in our bedrock and they're water soluble and then all these other bubbles of other things that we don't really um, need or want things like benzene known carcinogen, formaldehyde, all those things are trapped in deep geological strata too. So now you have this toxic flow back that's radioactive and full of all these carcinogens and we don't have a technology. There's no technology that exists to turn that back into fresh drinkable water. And uh, again, it's poisoned forever. Uh, and so, and we have no place to store it, no solution for that. So air and water can, are both contaminated by fracking, um, but something else goes on too, which is that out of the ground come ethane and propane and butane, these other hydrocarbons that are not natural gas or oil, but that can be sold by the energy industry to the petrochemical industry to make these uh, plastics and pesticides I mentioned. So now we are in the process of building um, and permitting, We're not, haven't, the ground hasn't been broken yet, but an ethylene cracker north of Pittsburgh, um, which will take all this ethane um, and turn it into ethylene, which is the building block for a lot of chemicals. And so the chemical industry is booming right now um, because of the, uh, of the fracking boom. So what I want to suggest then is that the road to toxic chemical reform, if that's your, what you're working on, that's the instrument you play in this great orchestra, that's the instrument I've been playing for 20 years, is trying as a, as a cancer survivor, um, as somebody who wants green chemistry to be sort of, which, we, which exists, we know all these non-toxic ways of doing things. And if we as mothers want to be able to buy the non-toxic solutions and, and not have toxicity be a consumer choice, but just be the way we do things, 
we can't get there until we change our energy system because we're just blasting more and more of this ethane out of the ground and it will be turned into toxic chemicals. So the road to toxic chemical reform runs straight through our energy policy. So if you're interested in toxic chemical reform, you have to be interested in clean energy and green energy too and renewable energy. These two fights are interrelated and the more we can join our forces, um, the more powerful we are. Um, but also, we've gone upstream to deal with the root cause of the problem and we're not just shouting into the wind. We can be effective. 